And the reason why we decided that is because as Jews, we know that we are never just observers to events in our own lives or in even in world events, but rather we are active participants. We're not spectators, we are players in the game. And therefore, what we do and how we respond, even if we're on the other side of the world, makes a difference. Today we're going to hear from two speakers, Rabbi Epstein, Rabbi Baruch Epstein, who has very kindly agreed to come and address us, to share with us the Torah perspective on October 7th and how we can respond to it, and also a soldier, uh, Chayal, from the IDF, who is here also to speak with us. And so, without any further ado, I'd like to call upon Rabbi Epstein to address us. Thank you, Rabbi Epstein. Well, thank you. Well, you don't know if it'll be any good. <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. Good, healthy, happy, wonderful, blessed, sweet new year. For all of us and for all of our Jewish brothers and sisters, and particularly our heroes from Machena B'nai Yisrael and Eretz Yisrael, to be a year revealed in evident blessings in all good ways. When I was asked to speak, uh, I was immediately humbled, not just by the wonderful work of the Chicago Mitzvah campaign, but by the subject matter and the day. Who am I? Me and me, who am I? And why is it that I should have something to say on such a special day? especially in the presence of such righteous people who are literally there defending our people and the land of our forefathers. But when you get asked, you have to say yes. And then you say, okay, what did I just say yes to? Much like our ancestors at Sinai said, Nasa, we'll do it. Now, what is it that we agreed to? So I thought, let me share not my words, but other people's words. For other people's words, oh, honored to have the police with us. Thank you. Thank you, officer, for all you do. I'll share other people's words, because other people's words are stories that stories that enlighten us, stories that uplift us, and hopefully stories that we can take some message from. I start with the story of a man, maybe many of you have heard of him. His name is Rabbi Daron Perez. He is currently the chair of the worldwide Mizrahi movement. Maybe you've heard his name. He's originally South African. He lives in Eretz Yisrael. He's an extraordinarily accomplished and great defender and lover of the Jewish people and the land of our forefathers. Daron has two sons. One son, his name is Daniel, and on October 7th, he was a tank commander and he was captured on October 7th. And for many months, they did not know what his fate was. He has another son, his name is Yonatan, who's also a soldier who was wounded very severely on October 7th, but was Baruch Hashem taken to safety. And his brother, Daniel, was still missing, unaccounted for, unknown of his whereabouts. Mm -hmm. Yonatan, the brother who was uh, able to get to safety and brought to a hospital, was engaged to be married. And Baruch Hashem, with God's help, he started to recover from his wounds and his injuries. And the day of his uh, celebration of his simcha, of his wedding, was drawing near. And still, no word from his brother, Daniel. And so the family was unimaginably torn. What do we do? Do we continue with the wedding? But how can we continue with the celebration when my brother, Daniel, is not with us? And as the weeks grew closer and the day that they had marked for celebration was in their vision and they bought their wedding suits and the flowers and the decorations and the band and the caterer, they were stuck with this conundrum. What do we do? Do we celebrate this wedding? But how can we celebrate this wedding without our brother, without the name? By he hayoyim, the day arrived. It was the wedding day. And as the father says, he decided, of course, that we're going ahead with the wedding, with this great celebration. And everything would be okay. And everything is not okay. And they all got ready, dressed for the wedding. And they stood under the chuppah, and it was okay. And it was not okay at all. 
And the rabbi read the blessings and they drank the wine and they broke the glass and they shouted mazel tov and everything was okay. It was so not okay. And they danced and they whirled around. They lifted him on the chair and they said l'chaim and mazel tov and wished him to build an everlasting edifice amongst the Jewish people. And it was okay. And it was so not okay. And that's how the evening went on. I wish I could tell you there was a happier ending, but sadly they learned shortly thereafter that his brother, Daniel, was no longer amongst the living. He was, as we say, Zechret Tzadik Lebracha, the righteous. Their mere memory is a blessing, for he died in defense of Am Yisrael and Eretz Yisrael, in defense of his people and of his land. And so as Rabbi Perez remarks, and I am humbled to quote his words, it was okay, it was so not okay. We can celebrate and we can be sad all at the same time, like a heart that pumps. If it pumps all the time, it's not okay. It has to pump and relax, pump and relax. To use the Kabbalistic terminology, it's rotzoi, it's running, and it's shuv, it's returning. Running and returning. Okay, so not okay, all at the same time. How can it be okay and so not okay all at the same time? I can't give you a rational explanation. I can only tell you, this is the legacy of our people. For 3,500 years, we have mourned at tragedy and we have celebrated at triumphs. We have had times when it's okay and times when it's so not okay. And sometimes those are the same day. Sometimes the same day can be okay and so not okay all at the same time. I want to tell you another story. This is a story that goes back to tw over 20 years ago. There were two friends. They were both Americans whose families had made Aliyah. One was from Baltimore, the other from the East Coast as well. And they decided, as sometimes teenage boys do, that that day when they left to go to school, they weren't going to school. They were going to go hiking. They were going to go out for an adventure. Tragically, they never returned from that adventure. And while they were missing for weeks, eventually they were found. Maybe you recognize these names from 2001. Kobe Mandel and his friend Yosef Ishran cut down when they cut school to go hiking. Kobe's mother, whose name is Sherry Mandel, wrote a book about her experience. She wrote a book about what it meant to mark the yard site of her son, what it meant to live with that awareness that her son was gone. And she quotes a great Hasidic sage. His name is Rabbi Dov Bear. He was from the town called Mizrich. It's in Ukraine, I've been there. And he, Rabbi Dov Bear of Mizrich, he's sometimes called the Magid or the teacher from Mizrich, was a disciple of the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, whose name was Israel, the strength of the Jewish people. And he, Rabbi Baal, Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, his father, whose name was Eliezer, died when his son was a small boy. And he told his son, there's nothing to fear except God himself. He lived in the 18th century. And he taught, that is Rabbi Dover, his disciple taught, that a person needs to regard himself as if he were nothing. Forget yourself in, only, in every way, and only then will you be able to attain the ultimate preparation, which is the same as the world of consciousness. For there, everything is equal, life and death, sea and dry land. Yet, we are created to be in a relationship with us. And as the Talmud tells us, every person is obligated to say, the world was created for me. So we must also think of ourselves and recognize the divinity within us. We must be full and empty, celebrating life and aware of the opposite of life. Death, if you allow it, can teach you this. A friend of this mother, Sherry Mandel, this friend cares for a child who sadly, tragically, never has a lot of physical limitations. And she, the friend, tried to comfort the mother, Sherry. She said, you know, your love for Kobe, her son, who she tragically lost over 20 years ago, 
is a deeper love because you don't get anything from him. He's gone. Yet you still have a relationship. You have a relationship with his soul. Your love is less selfish because you are the one who keeps on giving. And the mother appreciated her kind words. But she thought about it and said, you know, there's something deeper going on here. It may seem that I get, quote, nothing from my son, but that's not really true. The mother reflected. She says, I get something from him because I am both full and empty. I lost the love, the joy, the security of an intact life of being with my son. But I learned the beauty of surrender. I gain each moment the ability to enter that moment because I want to value every moment that is given to me for me and Kobe. You know, we're all very focused on this coming holiday of Yom Kippur. In a few days, we'll all be in shul and we'll all be commemorating the moments and reflecting on the history of what Yom Kippur has meant to our people. And we'll be thinking about perhaps the highlight of Yom Kippur which is a special service that only occurred, as it is described, achas barshana, one time a year. You all are aware that the center of the Holy Land of Israel is the Holy City of Jerusalem, and the center of the Holy City of Jerusalem is the Temple Mount. And on that Temple Mount, we have been blessed to have the Beis HaMikdash, the Holy Temple. And every day, multiple times a day, when we pray, when we daven, we face towards that area. We face towards the Holy Temple land. Even though we no longer have its physical presence, it still resides within our heart. And ironically, the holiest place in the holiest building, on the holiest landmark, in the holiest uh, country in the world was off limits. Nobody could go there. It was so holy, it is called the Holy of Holies, except once a year. Once a year, Achas Bashana, one person, the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, on one special day, went into this one special place. And in the description of his service, it tells us, no man may enter this space. Well, no man may enter it. What does that mean? But isn't the high priest obligated to go in and perform the ritual services in this holy of holies? What does the Torah mean when it says, no man may be there? And so in the Hasidic writings, it explains that when the high priest enters into such a holy place, he ceases to be his own person. He ceases to be about himself, about his identity. Think about that in our lives. Before whom do we feel so humbled that we feel not only honored and privileged to meet this person, we feel truly humbled, less about myself and more about the opportunity to be there. When we meet great heroes, when we read about the heroic acts of October 7th, of the people who sacrificed their own lives, we're not only brought to admiration and tears, we're brought to a sense of humility. For I no longer am about myself. Well, let me tell you what I did. Rather, we are awed and humbled by that moment. So the high priest has numerous intense responsibilities for which he would rehearse for weeks in advance to be done on the holy day of Yom Kippur. And you recall from the liturgy that when he would emerge from the Holy of Holies, after completing his tasks, there would be great celebration and song, and everybody would chant like the sun coming out in the cloudy day was the face of this great Kohen Gadol. But yet, he wasn't there. He wasn't there, but he was there. It wasn't about himself, about, look what I can do. It was about being in that moment, in that special space. That's the lesson of Yom Kippur. And perhaps, as we who have been struggling for a year to be both joyous and somber, to commemorate the triumphs and always aware of the tragedies, to be okay and yet be so not okay all at the same time. We have all been called into a new level of humility, 
a level where it's not about myself and my accomplishments. It's about the opportunity to be in service of something far greater than myself. And so what is our response, as the rabbi mentioned? It is to mourn. It is to celebrate. It is to reflect. It is to resolve for the future. So let us take this energy and let us direct it into pushing back against the darkness with some more light. The world is so desperate for it at so many levels. There are the campaigns, especially for Jewish women and young girls, even as young as three years old, to light candles. This Friday, you get a unique opportunity. You light one candle, you have essentially two mitzvahs. It's for Shabbos and it's for Yom Kippur. You get to combine them in one bracha and the Shechianu. And then we have so many days with the holidays of Sukkot and Shabbos Cholamoid, so many opportunities to bring light, so many opportunities to do mitzvahs, to help another person do a mitzvah. And while we are okay, and we are so not okay, while our heart beats, and there is the pulsating, and there is the resting, and while we are totally present, we are so aware that there is something so much greater than us. And so as we are gathered here today to not only comfort one another, but to resolve together that truly we will be that one special day, that one special person, that one special people in that one special place. Me ka'amcha ki Yisrael. Who is there like the Jewish people? There has been unprecedented aliyah in the last year. More people have moved from the comfort, comforts of suburbia to live in Israel in this past year than in any year for decades. Do we see people moving back to Ukraine? Do we see Ukrainians saying, I'm going back? No, they say, boy, am I glad to be here. And yet we see young families with small children in comfortable homes saying, I need to be with my people and selling their homes and their cars and moving to Eretz Yisrael. Don't they know there's a war going on? but they know what's going on. We are Am Echad. We are one people. Let us send out this message to the entire world, beginning within ourselves, that we are Am Echad. We are one people. We have one God, and we have one commitment to make this world a brighter place. Am Yisrael Al Chai. Thank you so much, Rabbi Epstein. That was really very beautiful and uplifting. <clears throat> Before we call upon our representative from the IDF, Achayal Noam, we want to follow up with on the inspiration that Rabbi Epstein provided and to bring it down to make it a little bit more concrete. Um, Throughout this past year, a lot of people have felt very deeply on behalf of our brothers and sisters in the land of Israel. We felt the pain, and we've all wanted to do something. I think this is the most often asked question that people ask is, what can I do? And so when we were thinking about our response to October 7th, now that it's a year later, we really wanted to, here at CMC, present an opportunity for people to come together in a manner of unity, like Rabbi Epstein mentioned, in a way of achtos, am echa, goy echa, we're one nation, one people, and to focus on one mitzvah. Of course, there are many mitzvahs that we can all do, and we don't discourage anyone from doing any mitzvah they can do, and we encourage people to do all the mitzvahs that they can do. But we wanted to pick out, to select one mitzvah, and so we decided on the mitzvah of Shabbos candles, Yontov candles. This is a mitzvah which I'm sure many of us already do, and some of us are not yet doing, but we want to do it in a manner of achdos, in a manner of unity that can help us join those lights together. In just a moment, we're going to be seeing a very short, um, brief video clip uh, on the topic of what we can do. And it also includes the idea of, of lighting Shabbos candles. And then I'm going to introduce Chaya to talk about the specific 
opportunity that we are launching today. Um, before we get started, I do want to point out that although many people are used to thinking of Shabbos candles as a woman's mitzvah, in fact, the mitzvah applies equally to men and women. Of course, it's traditional in a household where there are both men and women, it's traditional for the women to be the one to take the responsibility to light the Shabbos candles on behalf of the entire household. However, when it's a male-only household, or when there's a woman, but she's not able for some reason to light the Shabbos candles, then it is certainly the responsibility of the man in that situation to light the Shabbos candles. So, are we ready with the video? Here we go. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to call upon Chaya to, exp to explain um, the parameters and the opportunity that we have now that we are launching for a Mivtza special campaign to strengthen the Jewish people through the mitzvah of lighting Shabbos candles. Thank you, Rabbi Jane. So um, it's a very special mitzvah to light candles every week before Shabbos. And it's not, as it was mentioned earlier, it's not limited to just women. It's for men who are living alone or um, if the woman isn't able to. So on your way out, we will have, we have um, plates of candles to take so that everybody can light properly at home. Um, if you have any questions, please ask one of us. We're happy to help. 
Lighting Shabbos candles is a very special opportunity to take the time to ask Hashem for what we might need, whether it is for our personal needs or for our community or for our, our nation as a whole. Um, it's a great opportunity to do it. And I know a lot of people here already light candles and um, are making a difference. So we are um, we would like to present a program to, or an opportunity to to do to this together, to light candles together by um, we have uh, so here we have 1189 flames and our plan is that on Mondays everyone will come in and take two stickers for the candles that they lit that Shabbos and we will fill up this chart and when the chart is filled we will raffle off a beautiful candle, a set of candlesticks. And if someone, if people here are already lighting, we definitely want you to participate and add. To, think about how you can add to the mitzvah and, and make it a more beautiful mitzvah. You can enhance your candlesticks by making sure you polish them before Shabbos, or you're making sure you light on time, or you prepare the candle earlier in the day, or you dress more special, more special than you usually would. You can set your candles or encourage other people. Is that your candles earlier? Your set your Shabbos table or um, encourage other people who might not be lighting to light Shabbos candles. And together we can fill up this this chart. Um, we will have raffle tickets at the front of the desk, and um, we hope that everybody will participate. If you need candles, we have them by the on the way out. And thank you very much. Thank you. Just to mention a couple of other things uh, to add to what Chaya said, uh, one of the other ways that we can enhance our uh, Shabbos candle lighting, especially if we're already doing it or even if we're not already doing it, is to set aside a couple of coins to put them in a, in a pushka in a charity box uh, before lighting candles, and that's a beautiful way to enhance um, the mitzvah of, of lighting Shabbos candles. Also, I know that some people may have some safety concerns about lighting a, a, a flame, a fire in their house. Um, if that is your concern, then it's certainly understandable. But um, you'll be happy to hear that it is there are ways around that. I know that there are some people, for example, who have a sink. They light the Shabbos candles in their sink. Yeah. That's a very safe way to light the Shabbos candles, obviously. Um, but but even more than that, um, if if you find that, um, for example, some people have oxygen in their homes or have other concerns about lighting a fire, um, then in, in those circumstances, it is certainly permissible, not just permissible, but it's it's a mitzvah is just as valid if you light with an electric candle. So we have electric candles as well, um, little electric tea light candles. Uh, we actually give them out in the hospitals to the hospital patients because, as you can imagine, hospitals aren't too eager to have real candles being lit in the hospital rooms. Um, so that is certainly an option as well, and we have all of that available. So make sure you're taking advantage of that, and I really encourage everyone to participate in this program. And together, in a way of achdus, in a way of unity, we can really make a very big difference. I'd like to introduce our next speaker. His name is Noam, Noam Weissman. He, he lives in the land of Israel, our holy land. He has been serving in the IDF as a soldier uh, since October 7 of the last year, and it is very humbling and a special privilege for all of us to be able to hear some of his experiences and some of his insights, and uh, he will also, after speaking, um, be making himself available for questions. So if you do have any questions that you'd like to ask, please, uh, out, out, once he's finished the formal uh, part of his address, he will be taking questions from the audience. Noam, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. We're good? Thank you, Rabbi. 
So uh, nice to meet everyone. My name is Noam, Noam Wiseman. I was um, originally born in Chicago. My mom is American, so you can hear a little bit of my Midwestern accent. Um, but my English isn't too good, so I apologize for that in advance. I do want to start my address uh, today um, just to show one image up front. This is a picture of uh, 101 hostages that are still held in captivity. I'll show it to the Zoom camera. I just wanted to start uh, this talk with um, reflecting that, showing that we are still in the middle of this whole situation. These are families, people just like me and my family here. It could have been us on that day um, that were brutally taken from their homes, from their bases, wherever they were, and are still being held against their will. And uh, just wanted to mention that up front before I start anything. Now, um, just to quickly introduce myself, um, I was born in Chicago. My mother is American, my father is Israeli. I uh, moved to Israel when I was six years old. I grew up in uh, Ranana, if anyone knows. Um, later on, I um, got drafted into the IDF at the age of 18, just like it is for everyone, um, to the artillery uh, unit in uh, the IDF. I was uh, selected to be uh, leading a medical team. I'm actually a combat field medic in my uh, profession in the army. So I give uh, immediate care on an emergency team together with paramedics and doctors um, that get kind of to the scenes first thing and give immediate care before we move them on to either an ambulance or to a hospital nearby or to a helicopter. So that's really what I was trained to do in my service. Um, afterwards, I was discharged. I finished my service uh, completely. I served from 2014 to 2017. Um, and since then, I've been in reserves. In my reserve, my unit is up in the north of Israel, in the Golan Heights, uh, mainly, sometimes around the Chirmon, the mountain Chirmon, if you guys uh, are familiar. So between the border of uh, Syria and Lebanon with Israel is where I usually serve. Um, and that's where I've been serving in reserves on a medical emergency team as well, um, where um, we give immediate care to really anyone who gets injured, whether it's uh, civilians, or um, soldiers that are injured um, during their activities. So that's about myself. Um, now I'll talk a little bit about October 7th. Um, October 7th was honestly a devastating shock um, to anyone in Israel and any of the Jews around the world. Um, that morning it uh, caught us completely off guard. Um, you know, it was just another Shabbat. We had the dinner the night before. I was with my family right here at uh, our grandmother's house the night before. It was, it feels like a different life right now when we look back at that. Um, there was um, 6 a.m. We wake up in the morning. I'm uh, asleep. We wake up from sirens. I live in Tel Aviv already with um, my girlfriend. Um, we wake up in the apartment from alarms. You know, sometimes in Israel, you get these alarms, you get um, missile threats all the time. So it's not that it's something too unusual to hear an alarm. It is a little bit weird, Shabbat 6 a.m. It is kind of uh, awkward like that. Um, but we get up, we um, pick up the phones, we get some phone calls and news, and we start listening and seeing what's happening. I won't go too deep into what happened. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the atrocities and, and the devastation that went through uh, the country on that day. Um, enough has been said, but it really was a shock on a personal level, on, on the people, the day-to-day, -day, there was a shock. There was just crazy anxiety and feeling of discomfort. Um, it really felt like uh, survival for us Jews again, after what we've been through, Holocaust and wars and things that happened to us over the history. It felt like we were, were fighting for survival again, just in a moment, just like that, just on a Shabbat morning. The country uh, reaction was um, of a high scale. The citizens um, took over together because uh, the government wasn't as ready as the citizens were, and the citizens took care. Um, there, we opened citizen centers and uh, areas to collect and distribute food, to collect and distribute equipment for soldiers, for people that were in danger, 
um, people left everything on that day and, and took their cars and risked their life to go down south and to save families, to save babies, to save children from what was going on down there and the terror attack that was still ongoing. Um, obviously, the army was called up. I was called up as well um, during that day, that week. Um, I was called up to my Miluim unit, um, where I saw together with me in my unit people, you know, I'm still young, I'm still, I'm not married yet, don't have kids. So with me were men who left their families, who left their children, their wives, they left everything, their businesses that they have, um, they left everything behind to come to uh, the borders, whether up north or down south, and to go inside, and uh, they left everything behind them to fight and to secure um, the people. Um, people came in from abroad, around the world, people in South America, Asia, United States, people got on flights, left everything behind them to come to Israel to be together and to help uh, the army on this effort to secure everything back after what we went through. Um, what this brought essentially was um, a sense of unity in the people. It didn't matter where you're from, if you're Ashkenaz, if you're Sephardi, it doesn't matter. We're all together, we're all Jewish, we're all fighting. Some of us even aren't Jewish and we're still in the IDF all together. We're all Israelis, we're all connected to this special place. And uh, we're all holding hands together and, um, and holding the home together for each other. Um, it, brought, it brought great unity, the citizens together. Afterwards, uh, the army and the government all understood um, this case is bigger than all of us and we need, to, we need to step up and we need to stand our ground and uh, to protect each other. Um, I do want to mention a few points about um, in connection to what the rabbi was speaking about and Rabbi Wolf is the spiritualism that came in from this day from October 7 and the meaning of what it is to be Jewish during this year and this time um, because as a soldier in the Miluim, I was serving up north. I was taking care of uh, people who got injured from, you know, smaller missiles that were hit or uh, I say, Kakbami, Drone. drones that were attacking the area. So a lot of what I was seeing was a lot of soldiers, a lot of Miluim. We were sitting there, we were praying. We had our Kiddush on Yom Shishi. Um, people were lighting Shabbat candles from, you know, anything that they could light on the side. They were holding on to our tradition in those moments. And as a soldier, these moments mean a lot, and they hold you to remind you where where we're from, why our people are special, why why we are united together in this cause and for our country. Um, and the amuna, the amuna, the belief, the prayer, the it's it's a huge part of um, of being a soldier and living in Israel and just being a Jew around the world. I think it's what unites us. It's what reminds us always where we come from, and what we want to do with this. Uh, with this assignment we have as being the Jewish people. Um, so of course I mentioned uh, Kiddush and Tefillin in the mornings. These are things that I would see all the time on the borders. People were doing things inside of Gaza, inside of Lebanon in the north. They still are to this day, um, taking their Tefillin with them, taking their Shabbat candles, whatever they can. It is a huge part of, um, of the army and of the people in general. Coming to a uh, conclusion here. So really, I think um, why why you guys called me to speak today mm -hmm. and uh, to come here is really not um, not to ask for tzedakah, not to ask for anything uh, for the idea for, for Israel, but really just to create some level of awareness, um, to create some unity between us and Israel, the soldiers, and you guys as a great community of uh, people that are connected to this uh, mitzvah campaign in Chicago and all the Jews, the Jewish organizations in Chicago to really um, keep in mind that it's important how united we are in this time, in this year. We still have hostages that are our brothers, our family. Our family is big, the Jewish people, and we still have brothers who are being held. It's important that we, we be united for them. Um, it's important that we as Jews are staying nice to each other, help each other out protect each other more than anything. Um, we have that inner strength that has helped us to get through. I can't even start talking about what we've been through as a people, because it's uh, not for me to say, um, but we have that inner strength and our pride 
to protect each other, to stay strong for each other. And just to mention that Israel alone, me and my brothers in Israel, and my family, and all the soldiers can't do it without um, the thought and the belief of the Jews around the world as well. So um, that's all for today. It is open for questions, so if anyone wants, uh, go ahead. And so many of us had relatives, friends, who are in the IDF, who are doing a wonderful job. But my big question, how many hostages do you think? Thank you for that, first of all. And uh, he asked a question. Um, first of all, he said, um, Thank you for the service. And then he asked, um, how many hostages do I think are surviving right now? Right? That's the question. So honestly, that's not a question for me to answer. I'll be honest with you. Um, there's intelligence units and uh, people in the army high above me that uh, maybe know the answer to that. We have to believe. We have to believe that they're all still alive and waiting and still an option to save them. We have to pray for this. I pray for this every morning. I do my tefillin. I say a prayer for the hostages that are still holding strong. Obviously, uh, I'm not going to go into what the government is doing and what the, they can do more, maybe. It's not for me to say. Um, of course, I'd want the hostages all to be freed now in one way or another. Um, but whether they're alive, we have to believe that. We have to believe that to move on and um, carry on together. Yeah. I want to know, what kind of rooms did you have? And number two, are you going to serve again in the army since you got hurt? What the number two, if I'm going to serve again? Yeah. So the first question she asked was um, what kind of rooms we had in the army. So it really depends um, where you're assigned. I well, I wasn't injured, um, essentially. Yeah. Oh. You're, I think you're talking about my brother who was injured in the past okay. operation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is my brother, Adam. He was uh, injured in the past operation in his fingers. He broke a few of them when he was working. Um, but uh, generally, like the room that you stay in and where you stay in, it depends whether you're on uh, on the ground outside. Sometimes you can just uh, Is he gonna serve build again? a camp. Yeah. Uh, maybe. We don't know. We don't know. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, what is your real profession? What do you do, uh, what do outside of the service? So her question was, what is my real profession? So I actually uh, work uh, in high tech in Tel Aviv. So I work in a high tech company called Natural Intelligence. I do a uh, business development. So that's what I do in my day to day. But, you know, when the army calls you, you leave everything behind. You, you forget what you work. You go to protect your homeland. Anything else from anyone? Thank you guys very much for today. I want to thank Norm very, very much. And it's not just for your talk, but also for your service to the land of Israel, to the people of Israel. And as a representative of all of the Chayalim, all of the IDF, your, your, your brother, your cousin, I'm sure. Um, and as was mentioned before, we all know people in Israel, we have family, we have friends, and our hearts are there, and we're constantly thinking of and praying for the people of Israel, the hostages, praying every day for the release and the well-being of the hostages, and the well-being and the safety of the entire land of Israel and the people of Israel, and the nation of Israel. And thank you so much again for coming here and for making it real for us and for helping us to strengthen our connection with you, with the people of Israel and, and with all of, one, all of each other, um, which is so important, as you mentioned. And as I said at the outset, it really makes a difference, not just personally, but it makes a difference to the entire world. So just to conclude, I want to wrap it up by once again encouraging everyone to think about, each one of us should think about what we can do in our lives. It's not something which is on the other side of the world and not here. It is something which each one of us can make a real difference 
by resolving, by, by praying, by believing, by resolving to do what we can do, to do another good deed, another mitzvah. We have a special campaign for people to light Shabbos candles, to enhance their lighting of Shabbos candles, to do it in a way of, of actus, of unity. And it's a very beautiful uh, opportunity. I encourage everyone to participate and tell your friends about it. And together we can make a real difference. And I will conclude by saying, as Rabbi Epstein did, Am Yisrael Chai, the Jewish people, lives on, God willing, with God's help, there will be peace, there will be victory, and thank you all again for coming. I'm going to ask everyone to make their way out slowly. Uh, we have two ways to exit. There is this open door here leading to the main atrium. There's also an, an exit that takes you directly outside through the back of the room here. There is an exit uh, straight into the parking lot. Um, please take your time. There's no reason to rush. And remember to stop by the front desk and ask Chaya about getting some Shabbos candles. Thank you, Mark.